Welcome to Derailed Trains of Thoughts. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Derailed Trains of Thoughts, episode 13. This is Timothy Deal, a.k.a. Omnixtith. Man, I forgot about the nickname. Okay, this is uh, Nick Hayden, a.k.a. Dada. <laughs> well, my, my, my son has been calling me Daddy and Dada quite a bit lately, and it's very cute when I come home from work and he's sitting at, at the door going, Dada, Dada, Dada. And it's a great way to come home from work. Well, I figured that must be a, a relatively new one. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and most people don't call me Dada before. I was thinking the other day how interesting it might be if we actually continued a podcast with our nicknames like through the entire episode. <laughs> I don't think we'll do it this time. <laughs> I'm not going to call you Dada. <laughs> Welcome, folks. This was another. This is our second time now recording from the same place. I am back home in Indiana, having finished up at grad school over in Regent University. Uh, hopefully this episode will be a bit more timely than the last one, which... <laughs> I, I did realize it was like a month after we taped it. Yeah, it was kind of ridiculous listening to our project update and me talking about a film... Coming that, out in May 3rd or something like that. <laughs> yeah, which had premiered like weeks ago, but... But no, uh, graduation, all that went well. Um, Piece of Cake actually won the best film of the Regent Student Showcase, Faculty Choice. So that was very gratifying. And I got to watch it, which was very gratifying. It is a very good movie. <laughs> well, well, thank you. Good piece of life work, but a really good experience overall. So can't complain about that. And so I'm I'm back home in Indiana living with my folks. Uh, been putting my editing reel together, which is almost finished. And planning some other little projects and getting distracted yep. by just living at home, which is kind of nice. It's kind of kind of crazy sometimes living back with the family after <laughs> having lived four years on my own, but 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 a nice kind of crazy. And I'm finally done teaching uh, my seventh eighth grade, and I'm done grading all my papers and everything. So I feel like I have like the last Thursday, I was sitting there thinking I have free time. <laughs> what do I do with myself? It's always a nice feeling after you get done with the semester. It is a really nice feeling. Because, I mean, you were teaching middle school and undergrad college. Yeah. Well, maybe not teaching, but you were grading that homework was for Taylor. Which was which was quite entertaining, and um, hopefully some of them are listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Talk about how great they all they, were. They, they, actually, I really enjoyed their stories, and it, it was quite a fun job. Good. Time-consuming, but fun. That's awesome. Well... Before we uh, move on to our story school, let's get to our first segment today. Listener feedback. Nathan has been very busy on our comment boards lately. Uh, Nathan Marchand, our writer friend, he had, he had caught up. He's he has caught up with our episodes, and but he lets voluminous comments on each one. Voluminous? Voluminous? Is that the word I'm looking for? I think so. Where you write a lot. Volume yeah. Of, something like that. <laughs> I need an editor. My own editor. I need my own editor. Well, yeah, well you have an editor. <laughs> I, I'm just, I haven't, I haven't married one yet. You are an editor. Well, okay. <laughs> different type of, different type of editor. I, I don't have, I don't have a grammatician. Grammar <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a grammar Nazi working over, keeping watch over me. How did I get on to this? Oh, yeah. So Nathan left some really good long comments, which you should go read. He has some good points. And which, to be fair, I, I can understand when you listen to a podcast, sometimes you want to respond to everything that they're talking about. He did raise an interesting question because I talked about Pickpocket being an intellectual film. And he's like, does that kind of validate my point? And I'm like, OK. Uh, I because, should... because Nathan Marshall and previous had mentioned that Matrix was intellectual. And you, you were trying to distinguish the two in your comments, too. Yeah, exactly. And so I tried to distinguish the two. And, and certainly, as I commented, there, there are some very intellectual movies and some very emotional movies. I think the distinction between whether film and, or books are more emotional is, is kind of, you know, it is hazy, like we talked about and listened to feedback last time. But some films require more of you, more of the audience than others. Right. Which is something we'll actually talk about later on today. So we'll put Get a that. Yeah, keep a footnote there. Um, we'll get back to that idea. I will mention, he also commented on the villains. We had our made-up categories, and he mentioned that he had read somewhere else. They had made their own categories. This author talking about comic books and villains and something. The Unstoppable Force, which is, I guess, a sort of monster. You know, it just 
like zombies. Zombies are unstoppable for me. Yeah. You know, they, there's not really any thought process. It's just hunger or... I think you use Galacticus from Marvel Universe yeah. as an example, which I'm, I'm not real familiar with the Galacticus saga, but it's, he had a valid point. Um, that's what I remember offhand. But the other thing we wanted to talk about oh, in listener yes, feedback you. today yep. is a link that your sister sent to us, which I thought was very relevant with our discussion on, on young adult fiction last time. My sister owns a bookstore, as we mentioned, I think, last podcast. At some point. Um, and she sent, sent me this article about from the Wall Street Journal about basically the dark themes in modern young adult. Lots of abuse, violence, depravity, you know, sexual depravity cutting, really just grotesque scenes, um, and they give a, a new, new work of examples. The article is called Darkness Too Visible, and it's written by Megan Cox Gurdon. I would go ahead and hunt it down if you can. It's an interesting read. Yeah, it, and it talks about being careful of what we're putting into our teens' minds. And honestly, I was not surprised by this, having worked as a teen librarian myself. I am kind of familiar with this avenue where you know, sometimes it does get very dark. I, I recently looked back at a blog entry that I wrote for Max, a fictional character that I wrote a blog for for a very short time, who was basically echoing some of my own thoughts as a teen librarian. And he commented about sometimes the drama that these books go through and kind of asked, why would people want to do it? And I had asked um, one of my fellow librarians at the time the same question and she thought well maybe it's sort of like the horror genre where you know you, you go through it because it's fascinating it's like watching a train wreck sort of thing which i see but it just never really interested me one of the interesting uh comments that this uh, article brings up it talks about some teens and some teens read these books because they're suffering and they want to see uh, you know have someone to identify with there's an interesting quote that i like that goes entertainment does not merely gratify taste but after all but creates it and this author's worry was that what you read not only, you know, necessarily... She's not saying that, look, you read a book with violence, you're going to go be violent. She says that's probably not going to happen. But you cultivate a taste for certain things by reading certain things, which I think is, a, is an important point. This article mentions that sometimes writers say, well, I can write whatever I write, otherwise it's censorship, and censorship is horrible. Yeah. Um, it was interesting to talk to my sister about it, who owns a bookstore, and she's all, she, she does not like censorship. She does the whole banned book week. But at the same time, she's like... They can write wherever they want, but what makes the publishers want to publish a large number of these things? Mm -hmm. And I thought the author was still was also very valid. And yeah, they can write whatever they want. But as parents, we shouldn't feel bad about having some authority over what our teens and what our kids are exposed to. That's part of kind of the prerogative of parenting. Which unfortunately doesn't happen sometimes. That's true. I mean, and there's so many books out there. You're like, oh, I'm glad they're reading. Mm -hmm. So it was just interesting because, that, you know, Natasha doesn't read some of this really dark stuff, but she finds stuff like this in books. And the young adult section is not does not mean that it's, it's not like saying it's PG-13 Yeah. on a movie. It could easily be R, just teenagers are in the book. And sometimes books that may be appropriate for 16, 17 year olds, they're not going to be appropriate for 13 or 14 year olds by any means. There's a big difference there. Anyways, it's a very interesting article, and I should mention that someone else wrote a rebuttal to it. In Publishers Weekly. In Publishers Weekly, uh, Josie Leavitt, called Young Adult Fiction is Not All Doom and Gloom, and points out the obvious that not everything's that dark, that there's a lot of lighter books. Honestly, one of the reasons we didn't bring it up last time, at least I didn't bring it up, is I don't tend to focus my attention on that stuff, because that's not what I would normally read anyway. But the article, I knew there was dark stuff, that kind of shocked me how, and she probably picked the worst examples on purpose, Yeah. but how much, as a writer, I keep trying to figure out, why do you want to write this? I never understand some, some movies and some books, I'm like, okay, I get that, it's different, it's new, it's pushing boundaries, but what's the purpose in writing this? Now, I understand, you know, there's some books that are there to help teens feel not alone, but you can do that without being over the top. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think that summarizes that discussion. We'll put some links in the show notes for if you want to read these articles. Really, really good stuff. Oh, I do want to make real quick thing. Summer, my sister, also just came back from the BA book fair in New York City, brought back bucketfuls of books, and Natasha pulled some out, and I just thought it was interesting. She counted four or five of the ones she pulled out of, like, ten that are all post-apocalyptic. So, talking <laughs> of trends, yeah. many of these things are still going. I think Hunger Games probably pushes some of that. That probably, anytime there's a popular book in teen literature, there, there's a lot of copycats, which is true in a lot of mediums. Yeah, but not just not just <laughs> YA, but especially in YA. All right, well, with that, let's go into Story School.
We've kind of gotten into a habit with Story School of kind of pairing up topics. We did heroes and villains. We did adaptations, reboots, which kind of go together. Our theme that we're kind of into now is sort of almost from an audience's perspective of books, because we talked or of stories, because we talked about YA books last time. Today, we want to talk a bit about how to read a story. How do you approach a story? Because sometimes approaching the story just on a very basic level is, is sometimes not enough. Sometimes you have to, well, there's a certain amount in any story of how much are you willing to suspend disbelief. I think modern Americans, particularly the more cynical type, are a lot less willing to suspend disbelief. But what you bring to the story makes a big difference in what you can get out of it. Well, it's the whole reader response that the author said, wrote certain things with the book, but you bring your own experiences, your own life to it. And sometimes you bring your own expectations of what it's supposed to be as opposed to what it's trying to be, mm -hmm. which can sometimes completely ruin a story or maybe make a story much better than it really is, depending on what you're looking for or what you thought it was going to be. I know a guy, well, a guy from uh, To Be Start, which is a podcast that we've, I've gotten a lot of inspiration for this one about. One thing he's often commented on is that expectations are really huge in that, and he prefers to go into a movie without any kind of expectations because it sets a stage sometimes for how you can respond to it, which I'm not sure if you can do it without any. I think that's kind of hard, but it does make a huge difference in that, you know, if you go into something expecting it to be one thing and it turns out to be something completely different, you may not like it as much. And in the process, you might be losing out on something. When I was in college, I think, I want to say it's Henry James that wrote this essay I wrote but I, I could be wrong with that. Talking about when you're evaluating a, a, a story, there's two things you do. First off, did you like it? And second off, did it accomplish what the author set out to accomplish? Which are two very different things. There's movies that I'll watch and say, I didn't like it, but it, it tried to be such and such a thing, and it was. <laughs> it brings to mind um, Isaac Asimov. I read an essay by him once talking about Close Encounter of Third Kinds in Star Wars. He thought Close Encounter of Third Kinds was horrible science fiction. Really? Because he thought it was just badly done for what it was trying to be. But he liked Star Wars because it was just trying to be a space opera. And that's all <laughs> it was. Uh -huh. I don't remember his particular gripes with Close Kind of Third Kind, but I think for, you know, he's a serious science fiction author. That's it, true. He probably thought it was trying to be too spiritual or something. Or something. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Now, you have some examples from movies, from your film studies. Well, for an example of this, and because I talked last time about European films and how tricky it is sometimes to get into that, in a sense, it's a lot like when you're learning to appreciate art. Like as a kid, you see the Mona Lisa and say, huh, that's a picture of a pretty lady, big deal. But when you're learning to, you know, when you're taking an art class, then you start paying attention to like the subtlety of her smile, the ambiguity of it. You, you look at the colors, the shading, the, the contrast between light and dark, the fields that are in the background. The composition of it. Mm -hmm. You see all these things. And honestly, that's often a, what a lot of these minimalist films are like. A typical layperson will often see it and be completely bored to tears. They're not going to say, what is the point of this? <laughs> I watched Hero, the Jet Li movie, with, oh, yeah. with, uh, with my parents the other day, not really telling them what kind of movie it was. I said, hey, you want to see this martial arts film? <laughs> and kind of sort of tricked them into watching it, which it's a beautiful movie, but I know it was kind of hard for my dad to get into. He's like, let's kill this guy in red. Let's kill this guy in blue. <laughs> but to me, I'm looking at why is this part of the story told with this kind of cinematography? What's the culture that they're that they're trying to tell the story and how is it all going. Then you talk about suspension of disbelief. Those sort of movies have a very distinct way of fighting that you, if you're a realist, you're like, this is insane. They're like yeah. floating on through trees and stuff. They're like jumping on water. Yeah, and, and you're like, this is dumb. Yeah. But, but so much of it is like derived from, you know, the Chinese opera houses that where they would do that kind of yeah. thing. It's like a 21st century version of that. But, and that's kind of an extreme example. That's, actually a much more entertaining film than, you know, say Bergman would be. There's this film concept called mise en scène. It's a French term. And that just refers to anything you see on screen. And some films, not always, but some films you do have to take into account the idea that everything you're seeing on screen is there for a reason. We've talked with Brian a lot, you know, about sometimes the meaning of things. Like going back to Notorious, which I saw in Notorious recently, and if you guys haven't seen it, you should. But you talked about that long camera shot from in the party scene. It starts from the top of the staircase and then zeroes in onto the key in her hand. 
that is a purposeful move because first it establishes that this party is going on and then you're narrowing in on a particular person and then a particular object by showing that this lady still has that key that she stole from her husband hidden in her hand it creates a meaning there's meaning first in the large shot of the party and then focusing in on our main character and then focusing even tighter on what that object means. Everything's supposed to be there for a reason. Yeah. In some films. In some films. And that's where you work with the director in a sense. You could either say, this is really slow, this is boring, why is it so quiet, there's no music in this, there's no action, what's going on? Or you can say, why are they making these decisions? Which, and I won't, I will admit, honestly, these European films are not ones that I would probably would have watched on my own if it hadn't been for class. I have a bad habit of not watching serious movies when I should watch more of them. <laughs> But, you know, I've I'm, seen more than I have. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but again, as for classes, I'm no. it, left on my own. I'm going to watch anime and, and comic book yeah. films. <laughs> <laughs> I guess to use a very broad analogy, it's sort of like comparing classical music to what they call romantic era music. Mm -hmm. Where classical music, it's, you know, you have your theme and they play with it. And the whole the whole point of listening to the music, you listen to and see how the in what surprising ways the composer changes the theme. Where romantic music is much more a romanticism, I guess, is much more about trying to evoke an emotion. Right. I mean, so you can do both too. Mm -hmm. But some of it's more you're purposely trying to follow the the motions and the the what the director's doing, as opposed to having the director have his vision wash over you. That's true. Sometimes you watch it for different purposes. Yeah. It, it's an odd mix, because sometimes I can, sometimes I find myself, you know, just watching for the sake of watching, sometimes I find myself in a weird mixture of both. Remember, Citizen Kane was especially good at that, and I was touching on my emotions, but also because I knew it was Citizen Kane, <laughs> I was also very aware of the cinematography and stuff that they were doing. Well, it's very that. easy to notice the cinematography in that. Well, yeah, it's very, it's that is very true. distinct. Citizen Kane is a great movie, but there's also a reason why it gets taught in a lot of film, beginning film studies classes, because, yeah, all these tricks are very evident. When it comes up how to read a story, in my personal experience, I guess is my reading of Russian novel, especially Dostoevsky. I read the first one, and it took me like 100 pages to figure out what in the world was going on. <laughs> because you have all these characters, they're all interrelated, and they're all somehow motivated by this one person borrowing money from this other person. About 100 pages in, I'm like, ah, aha. And then the rest of the novel made more sense. Honestly, if you're going to read Dostoevsky, I would start with Crime and Punishment. It feels the most Western to mm. me. Because not only do you have the whole, it's Russia, which has a very different mindset that it's hard to explain, but you kind of feel in the books. But also Dostoevsky, who has a very distinct mindset. <laughs> so after reading several of them, you start reading the books over top of each other. You start taking ideas from one book, and it helps interpret the other book. Mm -hmm. Because he's basically saying different versions of the same idea multiple ways. So, you know, by the time I'm reading Crime and Punishment, which is like the last one I read, or actually I guess Possessed was, you're like, oh, this is why he's doing this, or oh, okay, this is plays into a theme that shows up other places. And sometimes having a body, not, you know, not only knowing kind of the culture it's coming from, or even the era for like silent films, or, you know, the conventions... I yeah. guess knowing the conventions, and not only of the of the general, but sometimes the specific artist. Yeah, th that's and you bring up a good point. It's not just understanding the style that it's in, which is a big part, but sometimes it's also understanding the culture, the country that it was made for. Sometimes the author's own personal beliefs and stuff. I mean, in a good film, you can appreciate without understanding all that stuff, but when you get some of the background, it takes it, out another dimension. Yeah, and I, I agree, because the story should hopefully stand on itself, unless it's from a completely foreign culture. Mm -hmm. Like Dostoevsky, I think I got now get more out of it, having read some of it. Miyazaki, same way. For early yeah, Miyazaki, I when I saw Castle Cagliostro, I'm like, this is great, and then I watch Princess Mononoke, and I'm like, what in the world <laughs> just happened? <laughs> and then... I came back to Prince Mo Monoke after watching numerous other Miyazaki. I'm like, okay, this mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I think, I think. well, I was probably that way to a degree with Princess Mononoke, but especially with Spirited Away. Well, and that's, that's which very is such a, Eastern. It's a, such a mind trip the first time you see it. Yeah. And then after you see some stuff and you get adjusted, you watch it another time, you're like, oh, there's a lot, there's a lot going on under the surface. And I think good novels are like that anyways, that there's a lot going on under the surface. And when you have cultural barriers or other sorts of barriers, it takes sometimes even more work. Mm -hmm. Spirit Away, you can certainly watch on a just fun level, but 
you have to engage it to really get it. Yeah. I know I didn't understand the purpose of no face until you kind of gave me your interpretation. I was like, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> because it seems like a very Western versus Eastern debate in some, well, I won't get into it here, but <laughs> a movie that I think I did not like, I'm not really sure it was a good movie. Then the director said something and thought, well, maybe he knew what he was doing. Um, M. Night. <laughs> Shyamalan, which I love his early stuff, but I went to see, um, what's the, what's the horror movie he did? The most recent one? The one where the plants kill everyone. Oh, The Happening. The Happening. I went to go see The Happening. Yeah. Thinking, you know what, I'm gonna, and I'm like, I could, I could not understand it. I don't like horror anyways. I did not get it. It was, it seemed very stilted, et cetera, et cetera, um, which I'm, people complain about M. Night in other ways before that. Yeah. But then I, somewhere he said he wanted to make a really good B movie. And suddenly I'm like, well... Maybe. I mean, if you're going for that, it makes a little more sense. I, I still, I, yeah, I, I still won't give it complete credit, but I, yeah. it, it at least let me reevaluate it a little bit. Well, you and I give M. Night Shyamalan more credit than some people yeah. would. We're actually both quite fond of Lady in the Water. And this might be a case of us just liking fantasy stuff in general and, well, and extending goodwill to it. Well, extending goodwill for partly. And M. Night, I think, got the shaft. In some of his movies, not all of his movies, because people went in expecting one sixth sense mm -hmm. every time. Well, people have gotten really hung up on his twist thing. Like, he always has a twist in the end. I think he would say he doesn't always have a twist at the end. I think he always has an Some... interesting ending, but it's not like he's trying to go for... There's that... I think Robot Chicken did a spoof on this one time where it was about his everyday life and then weird things that happened to him. And then he'd say, what a twist! <laughs> <laughs> Which, it's a funny skit, but it's not what he's about. But Lady in the Water, I think, I, and it's been a long time since I've seen it, I, I think I also like, because it's kind of a story about stories. Mm -hmm. And it's weird. I mean, you got suspending disbelief. Yeah, they're strange. I mean, you got people reading prophecies off of cereal boxes. But and... to me, I guess, to me, the, the whole juxtaposition of very modern day with these high fantasy ideas, mm -hmm. I like, but it didn't work for a lot of people. Yeah. On a side note, M. Night works much better with a small cast and a small location and single ideas than on big budget. Yeah, I ideas. think we've talked about before. Uh, did we in that? About, in our, about uh, Last Airbender yeah. and our okay. mutual Okay, well then I won't mention it again, but anyways. <laughs> <laughs> it is worth noting here, because we've been talking some about some very, some people might say elitist kind of you know movies or books you know with Dostoevsky. The same thing goes true, I think, with more populist fare. Because sometimes comic book movies or, you know, mainstream Hollywood stuff gets kind of poo-pooed or looked over by some, some critics as not really being all that meaty, all the, being too much fluff. Sometimes I think this material does warrant a more serious discussion of what are the themes here. They made, they made choices for a reason. And, and there's a difference between films that are made just to cash in on bucks but you know a good film even if it's you know comic booky or a blockbuster a good film still ha is trying to say something yeah and even they don't do it well they're still tr trying to pick everything for a reason I and mean, that's what they're, they hire people for i think that's one reason why the muppet movie is so beloved so much by people because some people say oh it's a fun puppet movie but for others it really connects with us on you know at a certain level there's a great article a blog post that maybe off the link to too that really touched home on this a lot about it being a creative person's journey and even if a creative person isn't going off to hollywood to seek fame and fortune which is not why kermit and the gang did that they wanted to make millions of people happy i think all of us would want to do that so there's something we can all identify with well, I think understanding stories, we tend to understand ones that touch us at some subconscious level. Like Muppet Movie, you know, certain people love it to death because it, it hits some deep understanding within us. And I think even if it's from a foreign culture, certain ones will make sense because it just hits there. You know, Miyazaki, mm. people love him because he's such a good animator or such, but also because he tends to touch some of that childlike or innocent sort of thing that sometimes you don't see, people can't do very well mm -hmm. or very easily. Yeah. So with all this in mind, it is certainly part of the creator's job to get the audience involved. It's not like we're saying give your writers and directors a blank check, necessarily. But at the same time, I think more audiences should be more open to seeing things how, how the directors see it. And I was going to bring this up earlier. 
I think Lost is a case where... <laughs> I thought we were going to get through it, but I almost brought it up. Yeah, well, but it's such a classic case of people wanting the show to be one thing and the creators deciding to be something else. And to be fair, sometimes the marketing people probably played a little bit too much into the whole conspiracy thing and not enough into showing it off as when, a... And I think there's three camps. I think there's people who said, well, I'll just take whatever I get. There's people who say... Okay, I'm understanding where the creators came from. There's other people who say creators are lying, cheating, hacks that just dragged us out for their money, mm -hmm. which uh, I have a hard time believing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, not very many creators are as willing to be as open about. I mean, they had a whole podcast talking about each episode, kind of unpacking. It was almost like a debriefing after each episode sometimes. And they played they play hard to get because. Oh, well, yeah. Because they had to. When they knew that the audience expectation was so high. Anything's going to disappoint, probably. <laughs> I, I couldn't let it go without talking about <laughs> Lost a little bit. Well, I almost threw in some Star Wars prequel stuff. Too. Oh, that's true. The, pre <laughs> the prequels have the same problem. It's weird. Nick and I have this thing a lot of times for much of malign stories that we really like. because We are very generous, generally. Yeah, which I think is a better way to be. I mean, sometimes I think critics, and I think MST3K kind of encourages this sometimes to a detrimental effect. Where we're always like, this idea of us yelling at the theater, I mean, people like, that's one reason why people like Statler and Wolder so much. But I would much rather be willing, you know, I want to be open to say, okay, you've worked into this experience, what do you have for me? I want to like what you've got here. And somebody just can't like it, you yeah, know, that's exactly. fine, but. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to like the happening, I didn't. <laughs> uh, yeah, me too. So, so yeah, I, I think that's, that's, I think that's a good way to place the wrap. Yeah, All that's right. good. So. Keep. So, go be generous to some story that you want to be hard on. <laughs> Save the nitpicking for the, for the, uh, what's, what's the, the name of the critic from Ratatouille? Oh, Anton Ego. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> save it for Anton Ego types. In many ways, the work of a critic is easy. We risk very little, yet enjoy a position over those who offer up their work and their selves to our judgment. We thrive on negative criticism which is fun to write and to read. But the bitter truth we critics must face is that in the grand scheme of things, the average piece of junk is probably more meaningful than our criticism designating it so. But there are times when a critic truly risks something, and that is in the discovery and defense of the new. The world is often unkind to new talent, new creations the new needs friends and with that said let's move on to our first soundtrack what's going on what's going on what's going on for our first soundtrack today it was kind of tricky figuring out a song, at least for me, figuring out a song that fit in with this kind of nebulous theme. But I decided to go with something that is... Nick's got a very modern orchestral thing coming up at the end of the show. But I decided to go with something really quirky, but also odd. So <laughs> if you're not used to listening... Well, hopefully by now you are. But if you're not used to listening to some of the more eccentric stuff that's on OC Remix. This might sound very weird to you, but it's it's very bouncy and it's fun. It's remixed from a game that's very close to my heart, Super Mario RPG. First RPGs I ever played. It's called Flubber Mountain, and it's remixed by a guy called Maze Dude, who's known for doing some really interesting uh, mixes. This is our second Maze Dude, I think. Oh, uh, I think you you might be right. We, he did the James Bond one. That's really. right. I forgot about Which that. Which is actually pretty normal for him. Yeah, and, but this is this is very lighthearted and sugar coated, and I think you'll enjoy it.
that was Flubber Mountain. It's a very fun song. Sometimes I would play that when I got to work at the library. Is something kind of crazy that wake myself up. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Next we have Cinema Selections with Brian Churchill. Again today we've got a, a new setup. This time I'm actually recording with Nick. And usually Nick records these segments with Brian separately, but this time we're both at the same place together, so uh, we, I get to participate. So, uh, hello Brian, how are you doing? Really good, Tim. How are you? Hi, Nick. Hello. <laughs> Fantastic. It's uh, it went straight from le- early March to mid August in the weather here. <laughs> it did. We didn't have a spring this year. No, not at all. So today, what movie are we tackling, Brian? John Ford's The Searchers, and it's uh, from 1956. Now, for everyone who has not watched this, I have seen this with Brian. And I'm in I, Blu-ray, which is very, very nice. And I just watched it recently, so we're actually on the same page here. But um, I can see Brian's got some notes, so Brian, why don't you uh, start us off here? First, I'll do uh, a little bit about John Ford. Uh, John Ford is known as the greatest American Hollywood director. He has such a huge reputation, especially among film buffs, let alone other directors and people in the business. John Ford was a prolific director. He did plenty of other films besides westerns, including The Grapes of Wrath from 1940, a war movie from 1945 called They Were Expendable, and then a little one from 1941 called How Green Was My Valley, which was done by Fox and is a huge, huge film. Also, Young Mr. Lincoln, which I had the pleasure of watching just last week, uh, starring Henry Fonda as Young Mr. Lincoln. Now, just for our audience, I want to mention that The Searchers is a Western. It is. They may not know that offhand. It is. So, starring John Wayne. John Wayne, yes. Are there any other uh, big uh, name celebrities, at least among classic Hollywood? John Ford, like many directors, he liked to work with the same people. And so he kind of had his own stock that liked to work with him over and over again. Some of these people included Jeffrey Hunter, uh, Vera Miles, Ward Bond, John Quaylen, Olive Carey, Ken Curtis, Harry Carey Jr., Hank Warden, and a number of different others. They all liked to be with Ford. It was like sort of a very, very big family. And what is, can you give us a basic synopsis of uh, the film for those who haven't seen it? The Searchers has been emulated by many filmmakers over the years. If you look closely, there is the same scene that is effectively mirrored in Star Wars A New Hope. Did you see it? Did you catch that one? I didn't catch it, no. When the house has been destroyed by the Indians and they come... Oh, Luke. It's almost exactly shot for shot. Same direction and everything. Wayne stares and actually I called it before it even showed the the, the house. I, I called it. I was like... Right now, Star Wars: New Hope. Now, and and it did like a split second later. Uh, but for, that's how much Ford has been emulated, and how much he's been admired. And uh, Kurosawa, as well as Orson Welles, were huge, huge Ford um, aficionados. They learned from him about how to make films. Anyway, John Wayne, he plays a character named Ethan Edwards. He returns to Texas in 1868 to his brother's home after the Civil War ended. He has a wife and three children, his brother does. Not long afterwards, a particularly vicious tribe of Comanche Indians affect their lives, and the Comanche Indians killed John Wayne's parents. Did you also see that? I think I missed that part. Did you see the gravestones behind the house at the Oh yeah. The... It said it was such a it's a very hard thing to see. <laughs> you don't see it until maybe the second time, but it says killed by Comanche Indians, something to that something to that effect. That explains a lot. (laughs) It does. And so it's a lot more complex than a lot of people give. And it's not just your average Western. No, no Ford film is an average Western in my opinion. I've seen like, I've seen about 12 of them and they're all fantastic. They're all great. And Ford is a fantastic storyteller. And so what happens is there is one girl in the family that was taken by the Indians and is still alive. And so John Wayne and uh, Jeffrey Hunter, they have to go and find her. And hence the term, The Searchers. That's what it means. That's what the title is. It's the two of them. Now, one of the big deals with this film, at least when I was seeing it with you, is the the difference or the contrast between indoor scenes and outdoor scenes. Is that a big Ford um, thing or just this movie? Actually, it is. Ceilings give a sense of enclosure and reality to a scene. 
And the way he does doors as well is rather interesting. But he also shows us the ceiling, and it's particularly to increase the contrast between the cramped indoors and the wide open outdoors. And there are a number of times where the camera's indoors and it goes out, and it's like this. You almost feel like you're in an IMAX theater or something. It's uh, an incredible effect. I know in a number of my film textbooks, they would show a picture from the last scene of the film where John Wayne is in the door frame with mm-hmm. the, the camera is inside the house, but yeah. the inside of the house is all darkened and the outside is almost blown out. Yes, it, Ford really knew the camera. You can tell how well he, how well he did it. You can tell how little cross-cutting there is in scenes. It's all like at once. It's all one take. And everybody's on the screen talking. And it sits there for minutes at a time, and the action unfolds, and as many as, what, like 25 people, 20 people on the screen? Yeah, it, it often it often struck me how far back, especially some, sometimes in inside shots where there are a lot of people, how far back the camera was, and you almost yeah. had to get binoculars to see everyone. Mm-hmm. John Ford's westerns are a direct opposite of Sergio Leone westerns, which are sometimes referred to as spaghetti westerns, right? Such as uh, Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, and all of those kinds of movies. Sergio Leone's westerns are nothing close to what the West was really like. Spaghetti westerns are just a bunch of guys murdering people for what? It's usually land, money, it all boils down to money. And there's nothing really good about any of these people. You don't really admire any of these people. Everybody's a hair trigger, you know, murderer, and that's how it is. And then everybody else is just terrorized in this little town. We don't even know why they're there. There are no businesses. It's just so contrived and fake and stupid. But at the same time, the cowboys of John Ford's westerns, I think, are America's samurai. They have honor. They have principles. And they have ideals. Like John Wayne's character, he's an anti-hero, so he has problems. But they all have honor and principles. Still, Wayne's character does. Quite a few, actually. John Wayne's character especially interested me. And since, especially at the beginning of the film, he's not a nice guy. You don't really want to like him all that much. Which is interesting, you know, considering it's John Wayne. The guy my sister is always cooing about whenever we watch westerns. Yes, this movie is really a character study in, in Ethan Edwards. And that's absolutely what the, the story is. And it's about him and his feelings and how, he's, how he confronts those feelings and how he has to handle it. And just as a point to the plot, of course, when you have a woman captured by Indians, the woman is generally considered better off dead. Did you see uh, even Vera Miles' character later on in the movie? She says that directly to uh, directly to Jeffrey Hunter's character, mm-hmm. where, where she says, you know, forget it. She basically writes her off, and it looks a little bit cold, but at the same time... I mean, what are we doing in Texas in 1868? This is about harsh realities. This movie is very harsh. There are a lot of big things going on. Well, why don't you say it? Beaten, you know it. No. Our turning back don't mean nothing. Not in the long run. She's alive, she's safe. For a while, they'll keep her to raise as one of their own until, until she's of an age to. There are numerous times in this movie where it makes you actually think about what's there and it doesn't show it, and it almost makes it worse. Mm-hmm. Like when he discovers that when the house has been destroyed, he looks at what we know is Martha, but we are not allowed to see it, and that almost kind of makes it worse. Uh, even you know, considering this movie was made in '56, it almost makes it. He he knew what he was doing. Ford knew he was. You know, this was a. It wasn't a device that he used, but I mean, it, it was a method to make you think more and to feel more from it. Yeah, another good example, I think, of filmmakers using the restrictions of the of the code, but still getting very much getting the ideas across of what has happened to these women. Yes, it does. And then there's one very big close up because John Ford doesn't use close-ups very much at all. But he did close in to uh, John Wayne's character when he's looking at this, the end of the scene in that cabin where they're all uh, with the women where they're trying to see if it's Debbie or not. Mm-hmm. And it zooms in, and, he's, and it has that stare. And there are a couple other places where John Wayne has that stare, and you know what he's thinking, and just all the stuff that's going through his head. His uh, character is extremely 
incredible. By the way, the book of the searchers does not end this well. <laughs> really? Uh huh. And I'm glad that at least they gave us that. And it really struck me as almost odd, even that you have this very heavy subject matter in a lot of it, but then there's these other moments, particularly more toward the second half of the film of just really goofy comic relief, which seemed a strange dichotomy. You certainly wouldn't see that in modern films. I don't think. No, it was, this was a very, uh, very Ford. John Ford had this touch and he does it throughout a lot of his movies. And what he did was a little bit Hitchcockian. What he did was he would use tension and then he would use humor to diffuse that tension so that you can build up a new peak of tension. So in other words, diffusing it in between and giving us a little comic relief, so to speak. But I don't think, I think Ford would probably, you know, try to kill us if we said the words comic relief. <laughs> he, by the way, he was very gruff. He, he had like a heart of gold inside, but he put on a persona where he was pappy. He was the gruff guy. And I don't remember when it was, maybe mid fifties, early fifties, somewhere around there. He had an operation on both of his eyes and then he lost one. Hmm. He lost his one eye, so then he wore a patch for the rest of his life over his eye, and it looked totally the part <laughs> uh, with, with his attitude and everything. <laughs> so he, in a lot of ways, he was the gruff cowboy. He was, and then John Wayne was his protege uh, for a long time. <laughs> um, it wasn't until John Wayne did Red River in 1948, and then, because Wayne had done a lot of films with Ford by then, but Ford apparently said... After seeing this movie, he said, I didn't realize that big SOB could act. <laughs> and John Wayne, who stands at six foot four, and I guess when you shook his hand, like your hand would disappear. <laughs> but that's yeah. how, big is, how big he is. It seems to me that sometimes John Wayne doesn't get enough credit in a modern audience's eyes. I had someone tell me that he just played the, the same part over and over. And to me, and especially with this is true with a lot of classic actors, but even with John Wayne, it's interesting to see the different dimensions that that part. Yeah, he's he is kind of playing the same part, but he takes different dimensions depending on the needs of the movie he's in. He does. I've seen about eighteen John Wayne films. I've tried to take in all the big ones. I think I've seen all the biggest ones. I am really amazed at how many different things he can do and how many different ways he can act. Hmm. I think it's interesting that the Searchers that didn't start even getting critical or audience notoriety that it does today until you know when no 70s really it was originally made in 1956 yes it was 56 and actually 55 and 56 are two of my favorite years in film as far as what i think are the biggest years in hollywood and the best years in hollywood i try to think in terms of back-to-back -back years and i think 55 56 produced some some very incredible movies and there were so many good ones that a lot of them just got lost in the crowd and Ford was always out there in Monument Valley. So many, you know, so much of the time he wasn't in Hollywood and doing all of the things that a Hollywood director should be doing, running around, of course, with all the social functions and all of those kinds of things, he just made his way in. But he, he was of course an institution, but at the same time he was out kind of away. So a lot of the time. You mentioned Monument Valley and the surgery is a film almost exclusively in Monument Valley, correct? It is. It's just different parts of Monument Valley, right? It gives you so much of the... You showed it to me, Blu-ray. So much mm -hmm. of the gorgeous setting, wide open spaces, which is, on a nice TV, really quite a view. It is, and this, you can tell that this movie was made for the big screen, just the way that everything is framed, and how he makes like a picture every time he points the camera at anything. That's how brilliant he is. Everything was in his head when he does films, as opposed to storyboarding Hitchcock. Ford didn't storyboard. Instead, it was like a mosaic all inside his head of just how it, would, how it should look. With regards to the way that it's filmed, it's filmed in a process called VistaVision, which is a widescreen uh, format uh, for Technicolor. It was developed by Paramount. The widescreen negative is twice the size of regular film negatives up to that point, which is why the films hold up so well, I guess, today. But I guess they're pretty big <laughs> compared to uh, yeah, pretty be. regular ones. Which means that's that's a wider aspect ratio than just... Well, there's the ratio, but then there's the actual size of the... Of right, the, right. Yeah. This division is not done anymore, I don't think. It's no. done for special effects work. 
Okay. Big movies too, like Dark Knight and you know big movies like that. They actually do their special effects uh, filmed in Vista Vision. So it's still around to this day, but is they never film whole films in it. It only they only filmed whole films in it from uh, it was a very limited time because obviously the technology came up so fast. Uh, there are a lot of directors that like to use it though. Ford liked it, Hitchcock liked it. There are a lot of really huge films, well known, popular films to this day that were filmed t- entirely in Vista Vision. Psycho, North by Northwest, a lot of them. It was kind of the IMAX of its day. It was. It was very. There, it's so pretty to look at. Mm. Uh, the Searchers is one of the most beautiful films to look at that I've ever seen, really. And it really brings out the power of Technicolor as well. One other thing I thought was really unusual was, particularly for its time, the way the Indians are handled, especially John Wayne's character's racism toward it. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. Um, first of all, with the disclaimer that the Indians that's seen in the movie are uh, Navajo Indians. Uh, from the reservation that I guess borders Monument Valley. Uh, and they were regulars, of course, with uh, Ford. They all liked Ford a lot, and they all did all kinds of parts. In case you didn't notice, though, Scar, the antagonist Indian chief, is not an Indian. Yeah, I did pick up on that. Right, he's, he's white. Interesting. I don't know Odd. why that... I'm not sure. I wonder if he had to be a SAG actor, the <laughs> Screen Actors Guild. Yeah. Well, that's what the rest of John Wayne's character is. is It's his dealing with the fact that his parents were killed by Indians, and that is where Ethan Edwards' racism comes from. And we have to go through the picture with that and see him wrestling with it and struggling with these demons. And at the end of the movie, you hope that there's a resolution. Would you say it was a revolutionary sort of depiction? Because, I mean, usually Indians are always, back then, are always seen as, you know, just the bad guys is all there is to it. It seemed like there was more colors here. Right. With the character, Look, who is briefly the wife of Jeffrey Hunter's character, she is given depth as a character, and we follow the story through, and and we keep track of her for a period of time. And we do get to learn about things that are more subtle, because there were a couple of subtle things going on there. Even though there was the comic relief with John Wayne saying, you got yourself a wife, and all these really... You know, fantastic things that would really bring down the theater with laughter when it was in the theater. This really, all of John Ford's humor, that really brought down the house. Like playing a funeral dirge at a wedding. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't work. My grandma and parents laughed at that. And I was like, what's the joke? And they're like, no, you don't play that. <laughs> with, 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 and then, of course, that the accent of that one character. Oh. The suitor? Dummy. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's hilarious. Charlie McCory. Yes. Okay. Charlie McCory's character. What is he? The mailman? Yeah, the mailman who plays the guitar. Yeah. Because he's bringing, uh, at one point, he's bringing a shipment to Vera Miles' parents' house. Anyway, with that accent that he has, do you know what accent that is? No, I couldn't place it. Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> And that, and he was told to use that accent by Ford. Uh, I mean, this is pure comic relief. Charlie McCory's character was pure comic relief, really, and quite good comic relief. And then, and then the fight. And what did the fight serve? There was, there was a struggle involving the marriage, but then at the same time we had this fight that was rather comical. But then, what does that build up to? It builds up to the final cavalry charge at the end. Hmm. So what do you have? You had a little bit of humor in between these weightier parts. Especially since the previous weighty part was when John Wayne and Jeffrey Hunter were, that was where their end point was before they came to the wedding. Yeah. Which, that was a very intense scene as well. There are a lot of intense scenes in this. Earlier in the film where John Wayne says, what do you want me to do? Draw a picture, spell it out. That's a very intense scene as well. Mm-hmm. And again, that, lend, that lends you to think about what could have happened back there when those other Indians went off the beaten path and all that stuff happened. It makes you think about it as opposed to making you see it, which is possibly worse. So give us a final clenching kind of review of Searchers for our audience. Why should they go out and get this? Besides, if you want a good Western, which I hadn't seen Western for a long time until I'd seen Searchers and really enjoyed it. On my journey through classic films, I avoided Westerns up to a certain point. This was the first one that I saw, and I'm so glad that this was the first one that I saw because it took me in and it really hits you hard. And it shows you how deep something like this can be as opposed to cowboys and Indians. That's very true. That's a good point. That's a good one. Good summary. Right. Boom. Uh, thanks for uh, sharing with us today, Brian. We'll talk to you later. Yep. Right away. Right.
I think that's our episode. Yeah, it was. Uh... Yes, that's our episode. <laughs> that's all we got. So that's all. That's all we got. <laughs> and we bring back this this catchphrase. Catchphrase. I'm going to say tagline, but well, tagline. It's sort of because we just say it at the end. That's true. That's all we've got. But hopefully, we're going to be getting back to a regular schedule. Yeah, these should be coming out every two weeks or so. Yeah. So um, it's nice to be it's nice to be here in your basements recording with you, Nick. We'll probably have some uh, guests on again in the next uh, several episodes. Fairly soon, hopefully. So, And uh, we have a lot of good ideas, but if you have other ideas for uh, podcast ideas, please uh, send them to us. Uh, contact us at our website, derailedtrainsofthought.blogspot.com. You can also email us at derailedtrains at gmail.com. Be the first. I don't think anyone's used that email address Not yet. that I know of, no. And we would love to have a... More comments, more discussion. Um, I know some of you people are following our blog and haven't left a comment yet. I'm looking at you, Alex. <laughs> Catherine. And um, please, uh, if you're on Facebook, link to us. Spread the news. More the merrier. Definitely. All right. My soundtrack selection is done in 20th century classical music style. It's apparently inspired by composers such as Messian and Scho uh, Schoenberg, which, um, if my friend Randolph is listening, he will die of a heart attack from my pronunciation. <laughs> but it is a remix from the World of Warcraft soundtrack called Les Gnomes Ex Exotiques. You're probably not pronouncing that right. Either. No, I I'm almost <laughs> certainly butchering it. It's a uh, 20th century modern classical. I cannot say it right. Les Gnomes Exotiques. Uh, th that is probably much closer. <laughs> It's a nice song. It's enjoyable. Uh, the, the the composer himself, who is or the remixer, is Ubochi. Man, I, I'm striking out today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sorry. I'm not gonna. I'm not sure I could. I could do that one either. Uboichi. I, I have no idea. Oboichi. We'll say Oboichi. Um, <laughs> if he's listening, he will kill a die. But he, in his letter, he, when he submits the remix, he says, "I don't expect a lot. Of, a lot of people to actually like this arrangement. Modern classical music is not for everyone." But still, I think you'll enjoy it. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty accessible for modern classical. It's mostly piano, yeah, from what so, I heard. So um, I hope you enjoy. And until next time, this has been Nick. And this is Tim. Adios. So long. That's all we've got.
find another neat little note that I wrote about that. That's why you have me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to rip into Sergio Leone. Do either of you enjoy him? Uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Where was I going with this? Help me, Peter Bogdanovich. You're my only hope. <laughs> <laughs>